Hi. Uh, before we begin this evening, I have just a few quick notes. Um, firstly, if you haven't already done so, please make sure that your cell phones are on silent. Um, please note that there'll be no flash photography tonight. And uh, after the event, there's a book signing upstairs in the lobby. Due to time constraints, uh, Dr. Wilson is happy to sign your books, but he won't be able to do any personalization. I just wanted to let you know. Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Michelle Sheffer. I'm the writer and editor here for the library. And it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight one of the world's most esteemed biologists and a very good friend of the library, Dr. E.O. Wilson. He's the author of more than 30 books and he's received the Pulitzer Prize twice for his engaging nonfiction that explores the intersection of biology, sociology, and the humanities. Dr. Wilson's research explores the world of ants and other tiny creatures, illuminating how all living things, great and small, are interdependent. As such, he remains an impassioned advocate for conservation and biodiversity, fighting to preserve the wondrous variety of the natural world. His new book, The Meaning of Human Existence, bridges science and philosophy to create a 21st century treatise on human existence. Dr. Wilson's slim new book is valedictory work, according to the New York Times. He stands above the crowd of biology writers the way John Le Carre stands above spy writers. He's wise, learned, wicked, vivid, oracular. Dr. Wilson will be interviewed tonight by Dr. Ian G. Sheffer, a fellow in infectious diseases at Temple University Hospital and a fellow at Temple's Center for Bioethics, Urban Health, and Policy. He earned, his doctor, he earned his MD from Temple University and a master's in bioethics from the University of Pennsylvania. He's also my husband, which is perhaps the greatest accolade of them all. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming E.O. Wilson back to the Free Library. Good evening. Well, it's uh, good to, to meet you finally in person, Dr. Wilson. And um, as I'm sure Michelle said, welcome uh, back to the Free Library of Philadelphia and, uh, and back to Philadelphia. <clears throat> so I wanted to start off in, in just sort of getting to know you the, this evening um, as we were having dinner. Um, I wanted to give the, our, our audience a chance to do that as well. Um, and, and one of the things I wanted to ask, um, you know, as Michelle was going through your, your many accomplishments, uh, you're, you're a very talented man. and you. You clearly um, could have been done extremely well in uh, in any field you would have chosen. What made you choose biology? Well, a biographical question. Thank you for making it easy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and not well, we asking, have to let desserts settle well, out. <laughs> I, you know, and, and not starting by saying, "All right, what do you mean by existence?" <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> so the easy question was that I grew up in the deep south where I had access to a comfortable outdoor life almost every day and in the course of which um, and I was allowed to, uh, no I wasn't allowed, my parents didn't know about it, <laughs> to uh, go anywhere I wanted to go you in the that. backwoods of the swamps of, and the river of banks and so on of Alabama and northern Florida and in the course of which I just came to love natural history. And I decided that very early I would be a, uh, uh, an entomologist. I decided that when I was nine years old and I took a homemade butterfly net. We were living in Washington for a brief period of time. And I went uh, out on quotation expeditions that I'd been <laughs> reading about in the National Geographic and gone to see Frank Buck movies. And I thought that's really what I'd really I'd like to do the rest of my life and uh, be uh, an insect collector and a tropical explorer. And uh, I realized that uh, it was extremely, that, that's a little boy's dream. And uh, to this day, I, am, I haven't changed. I'm about as immature as I was then. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, I guess sort of gets, yeah. gets to my next, my next question, a follow-up question. What, um, what about this field makes you so passionate about it to have been going at it um, you know, at such an, an in-depth level for so many, many years? Well, let me put it this way. Uh, there are perhaps 60,000 species of creatures that most people call wildlife. They're mostly vertebrates. 
uh, the fishes, the amphibians, the reptiles, the mammals, uh, and uh, the birds. And um, when people talk about seeing nature, they usually mean they go out and they see um, the flora, and then they see and they look for usually the wildlife, the big, bigger, well-known animals. But there may be only 60 or so thousand in the whole world of these. There are overall 8 million species of organisms out there by estimate. Right now we have, uh, we've discovered and we have a scientific name for almost exactly 2 million species. Um, but and the rest, somewhere in the city of 6 to 8 million, are still undiscovered by science. And these include what I like to call the little things that run the earth, um, the insects, the and other invertebrates that swarm through all of the habitats of the world, and they really run the middle levels of the uh, ecosystems of the world, in the sea as well as on the land. And so I became aware of that fact early on. Uh, and because I focused on that, uh, I only have one functional eye, and I can't hear very well in the upper um, registers. And what I did was, uh, but I have sharp vision in this eye, so I took insects as my main uh, subject of interest early on as a, as a boy, and uh, soon discovered that I had a whole world almost to myself to, dis to explore and discover. And that continued when I got to college, uh, that I was working on organisms that nobody else was paying any attention to, and I was making wonderful discoveries easily from year to year. And I still use that personal experience to recommend to young scientists that they pick a group of organisms or a kind of phenomenon uh, in these little known organisms to study. And they will have much greater chance of uh, real success in discovery and scientific endeavor uh, as a result <clears throat> than they would by taking a more traditional path. And, and that has held me transfixed ever since. And I still go on expeditions. I still Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Um, well, we, I, I did promise we can't, it can't be all biographical this evening, so I do want to talk about, um, about your book, um, which is fascinating and, and a wonderful read. Um, one of the things that, uh, that you talk about uh, in your book and that um, you know, certainly I've, I've come up against in, in the practice of medicine is that humanity's modern lifestyle has outpaced um, or somehow come to be at odds with the physiology that we've gotten through, through evolution um, and use the example of evolution not having enough time to cope with, you know, our, our modern diets and our sedentary lifestyle and, and that sort of thing. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, with your focus being on um, the social aspects of humanity, if you think that the rapid advance of um, information and communication technology and social media and, and that sort of thing has created maybe a, a similar disconnect um, between how we socialize and how we live our lives now with the social mechanisms that we acquired through evolution? And, and what implications mm -hmm. do you think that has for, for how we might interact going forward in, in the new modern age? Yeah, the dyskinesia, you might call it, has resulted in uh, something far more important and dangerous than uh, stomach aches and, uh, and uh, early heart attack. And that is the fact that we, um, we're still basically paleolithic in our, our minds and the way our brains are constructed and our instinctive patterns. Um, I would call our species dysfunctional uh, because one, uh, we have paleolithic emotions. I don't think they've changed since the early Homo sapiens of 200,000 years ago. We have Paleolithic emotions, we have medieval institutions that we still depend on, and we have godlike power. Now, that is a very dangerous and unstable combination, and that's what, uh, where we are now as a species. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, he didn't. He didn't say expatiate, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, so 